which is this course. Uh, so I'd like to welcome you all. I'd like to also thank uh, Dr. Peter Physics here, who has uh, coordinated this course for many, many years. I hope Peter will continue attending seminars. His uh, knowledge, his experience, and his, uh, uh, his, his general knowledge of this phenomenon. So I certainly welcome him, him to continue to, uh, to uh, come to these seminars. Um, I'll ask if any of the course participants please stay after today's seminar. I'd like to do some housekeeping things with you. And um, I think that's pretty much it for now. I'll we'll point out obviously we have a uh, session being videotaped and it's also being live streamed. Uh, this is Kevin Hogue, who's a videographer. Thank you, Kevin. Very and uh, Jane Dawkins is from the Dean's office. She's doing the uh, uh, the live stuff and uh, certainly so in and out probably. Uh, we do have another room set up, 1713, uh, so people will be here and welcome to the other room. Looks pretty comfortable now because the floor is only warm. It's my pleasure <coughs> this afternoon to introduce our speaker, uh, Dr. Andrew Peregrine. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, Andrew. I've been to for quite a while. He originally graduated from the uh, University of Glasgow. I won't give the year, but uh, uh, he took his veterinary degree there, and then he also earned a PhD there. Uh, he's working on blood parasites of cattle in Africa. Uh, after that, he spent 10 years. He worked for the International Laboratory for Research on Animal Disease in Kenya, where he helped develop improved control strategies for tropical parasites. Uh, he's been here since 1997 in the Department of Pathic Biology. He teaches clinical parasitology to students in all four phases of the uh, PMAN program. Andrew regularly provides advice to veterinarians on management of uh, parasite control programs. And at present, his current research is to improve control of drug resistant parasites in sheep and heartworms in dogs, and also to define the public health significance. Of the Conococcus multilocularis in Ontario. Um, Andrew is certainly a well rounded person, and outside of work, he likes to play hockey and squash and do all sorts of other things. I've seen a referee a few days, too. And disagree. <laughs> okay, Dan, thanks very much. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for coming out. Um, if you have any questions as we go along, please, please feel free uh, inter to interrupt. I came to OVC, as Dan said, in 1997, and at that time, no one effectively in Canada was talking about Lyme disease or the tick that causes it, because essentially we didn't have it. And since that time, there's been a dramatic change, and it's still changing dramatically, uh, and the disease, Lyme disease, is in many circles highly controversial, both in the human and the veterinary area, uh, and so wherever possible today, I'm referring to data that have been obtained by various people across the country, but I'm also basing a lot of my comments on what are called consensus statements. Um, the first is, this is the ACVIM consensus statement for Lyme disease in dogs. So they got a group of experts around a table and asked them all the controversial questions. This is a consensus opinion. There are always outliers that some of the drug companies like um, giving talks, but the consensus opinions are in this document. And interestingly, there's another one for human Lyme disease, which is this document, which is also extremely um, interesting. So I'll base my comments where possible on those two documents. Lyme disease is a bacterial infection transmitted by ticks. It gets its name from the place the disease was first diagnosed in a person, and that is Lyme in Connecticut. It could have been Guelph, Ontario. Um, but they beat us to it. And it was diagnosed in the early 1970s, but actually it wasn't a new infection to North America. There are museum specimens on the East Coast that they've been able to find evidence of the bacteria back over 100 years. So that's where it gets its name from. What I want to do today is to introduce you to the tick that cause, is associated with this particular pathogen. And the pathogen's called Borrelia burgdorferi. That's the bacteria that can cause disease. What I want to introduce you to, is to this issue is that there is, in fact, more than one tick 
certainly here in Ontario. And so just because you find a tick should not result in a monumental panic attack, all right? Because there is another one that's important for other things but has nothing to do uh, with the transmission of this pathogen. So what ticks do we find here, in on, particularly in Ontario, and what do they transmit? This is the question that I think a lot of people are asking, and it's fairly obvious from what I've said already. Is the risk of ticks, and particularly the risk of Lyme disease development, both in dogs and people, is it increasing across Canada? I'm going to talk about the disease in both people and dogs because there are some very significant differences, and regularly the public does not appreciate that. Um, so I'm going to hit that particular issue. I'm going to focus on specific vet issues at times. How many of you have a dog that's screened for heartworm? I'll bet you more than half of you, without knowing it, probably, are having your dogs automatically screened for evidence of exposure to the pathogen that causes Lyme disease because we screen dogs typically with a point of care test like this that simultaneously, for only a dollar or two more, allows you to screen your dog <laughs> for evidence of exposure, that is antibody, to the bug that causes Lyme disease. But I think it's a sensible question, should we be doing that? Particularly if it doesn't change the outcome for the dog. Because the next question is, if you have a healthy dog that tests positive for that, with that kit, so it has antibody, if it's healthy, how should you manage it? Because if the answers don't do anything, the obvious answer question from the client is, well then why are you doing it? But we are. And lastly, I want to make it practical for you folks, giving you the types of questions that both vets, well, vets get with respect to dogs, and that is, I have this tick, will my dog get Lyme disease? And I'm just going to finish with a few points with respect to prevention. If you read the textbooks, you get this frightening bit of information that across North America, on your dog, you could find any one of these ticks. So that across North America, there are a large number of ticks. Now, as far as we're concerned, at the current time, here in Ontario, essentially 99% of all the ticks that are ever found on dogs that have not traveled are these two. The American dog tick, Dermacenta variabilis, and when I came to Ontario, that was the only tick in the province. However, that's certainly not true now. We also have the deer tick, Ixodes scapularis. So, first question, is it important to identify the tick? Certainly in Ontario, because there's more than one. So I want to show you how to do it, because a lot of people um, are not good at this, but it actually is, in fact, very easy. I'm going to show you the two ticks we have here in Ontario. These are unfed ticks, unfed adult ticks. Do they look the same or different? Okay, they are different to my eyes. Let me... <laughs> I'll just assume you're all reserved like vet students. So let me just show you. All right, the structure to look at always on ticks. So there's the head, all right, there's four pairs of legs. All right, it's an adult. This structure here, it's a plate that's sometimes referred to as the scutum. And the question you ask yourself is, is it all dark brown or is it multicolored? Is it all dark brown or ornate? We talk about ornate and inornate ticks. Pretty or boring ticks. <laughs> all right? So on the left, is this scutum, this structure here, is it all dark brown or multicolored? That's more confident. <laughs> Excellent. So as soon as you see that, you know that essentially here in Ontario, there is only one tick it could be. It's the American dog tick. Its scientific name is Dermacenta variabilis. And as far as Lyme disease is concerned, it's great. It plays no role whatsoever. So if you pull this tick off, either your dog or yourself, and you see that structure straight away, you don't even have to have nightmares about Lyme disease because it's not possible, all right? The tick on the right, is that scutum all dark brown or multicolored? All dark brown. It's got reasonably long mouth parts. This is the deer tick. Its scientific name is Ixodes scapularis. And as far as we're concerned, in this part of North America, it's the only tick that transmits this bacteria, Borrelia bugdorferi, the cause of Lyme disease. 
Now, I just should make a point at this, at this point. The word disease, strictly speaking, means an impact of infection on health. So disease means more than just infection, but it's progressed to make the animal or the person sick. But it's used rather loosely by the lay folks just to mean infection with that bacteria. But it's important that in both, to recognize that both in people and particularly in dogs, most infections in dogs, most infections never make dogs sick. It's completely different in people. Most infections progress to disease in people. Dogs, very different. So, those were two unfed ticks in a textbook. All right, now I want to show you the real world where we usually only find on our pets engorged ticks. So, this is a picture um, of now a fully engorged tick, all right? It's the same tick, it's a female. She's filled up with blood because she wants to produce, she needs to produce eggs. And I brought a model here because again, look at the sputum. It doesn't change, it just, it's down here, all right? So on this model, and by the way, just in response to a vet student the other day, this is not a real life size. <laughs> Dr. Lismore, you have to do something. <laughs> anyway, but this is the structure here, all right? It's still right behind the head. It's the sputum. And that's what you need to look at, all right? So, first question, is it multicolored or all brown? It's multicolored. Is my going to get Lyme disease? No, it's the wrong tick, all right? So, this is dermocenter variabilis. And as I said, it used to be the most common tick in Ontario. I don't think that's no longer the case. Few comments about this tick. If you read the textbooks, the textbooks correctly say that this is the vector of the agent that causes Rocky Mountain spotted fever, a nasty pathogen, both in people and in dogs. It's in the textbooks, but it's not in Ontario ticks. So there is no risk, as far as we're aware of, if your dog has this tick and has never left Ontario. It is the vector of a pathogen that causes a disease called tularemia. However, in Ontario, as far as we're aware, all the strains we have are not tick transmitted. They're waterborne. So again, it's a great tick in Ontario to find. And very rarely, there's a neurotoxin in saliva associated with this phenomenon, but it's incredibly rare. Now, one of the issues we're going to come to in a bit is where do ticks live in the environment? And to answer that question, you need to know the life cycle of ticks because the different life cycle stages have preferred hosts that they feed on. That fully engorged tick I just showed you is fully engorged to produce eggs. When that tick drops off into the environment, they lay thousands of eggs in the environment. And then what happens? So this is in the environment, the eggs are released, and out of those, these tiny little structures called larvae, three leg, six-legged structures appear. They feed, usually on wild rodents, most ticks do. They feed on them when they're fully engorged, they detach, and they drop back off into the environment. They then molt, like a snake does, all right, to the next stage that's called the nymph. They have a preferred food source, you'll see what those are in a minute. Once they're fully engorged, they drop off into the environment, molt into immature adults. We usually only see them at this stage in part because of their size. So, what are the species you find these different stages on? I just indicated the structures that hatch out of eggs. It's typically voles and mice and other wild um, rodents. The nymphs, we occasionally see on dogs and cats. We certainly see them occasionally on people. All right, and certainly on wildlife species. The life cycle stage we most commonly see on people and our pets are the adults. They're bigger, all right? But they do also feed on wildlife species. Where do you find them? Not everywhere, all right? But many of the areas we go hiking, all right? Along trails, open grassy meadows, immature forests. And we usually see this tick late spring, early summer. Well, that's when we see the adults. So. That's the tick, that's the good tick. Here's another tick that came into a veterinarian. Will my dog get Lyme disease? Is it the right tick? So, you can see the scutum's all dark brown, all right? And is this tick fed? Yes, it looks a very happy tick to me. So, this is Ixodes scapularis. These are two that have not fed, 
all right? Its common name is the deer or the black leg tick. This is the tick that is of primary concern to Public Health Agency of Canada. Why? Well, for three reasons, interesting enough. Number one, as you've already heard, this is the tick that transmits the agent that causes Lyme disease. The, the acronym on the right, 4DX Plus, refers to this kit. And I've indicated on my slides what you're screening for every time you use this. It's primarily used to screen dogs for heartworm, but you also look for antibody to this particular pathogen. By the way, I have some ticks here, if you're interested, unengorged and engorged ticks, just so you get a true appreciation for size. It also transmits anaplasma phagocytophilum that causes this disease in people and in dogs, and it also transmits this Babesia species that is associated with disease in people, not dogs. So this is the tick that the public health agency is concerned about. Why? Because prior to the mid-1990s, we effectively didn't have it anywhere in Canada. And as you'll see in a minute, that's changed dramatically. How big are the different life cycle stages? Claire Jardine, I know, is here. This is one of Claire's grad students' pictures, which is one of the best ones. Claire was involved in a project in the Thousand Islands area, and this came from there. That's a larva. Do you think you would see it if it was on you? That's a nymph. And that's, those are two adults, all right? Um, not uh, engorged, all right? So you can appreciate it's very easy to miss them, especially on our pets. What's the life cycle of this particular tick? So what does it need to sustain itself and become fully established? So it's called the deer tick because the adults preferentially prefer feeding on deer, especially white-tailed deer, all right? It's, it's a wildlife parasite, essentially. The adults, when they're fully fed, all right, drop off into the environment. Right? And at that point, just as I mentioned before, they lay their eggs. If the mother is infected with the bug that causes Lyme disease, Borrelia burgdorferi, none of the offspring are born infected. They're all clean, even if the mother's infected. So they, the larvae hatch out of these, and what do they like feeding on? Wild rodents, especially white-footed mice. And this is the point at which they become infected because Borrelia burgdorferi occurs in the wild in wild rodents. Typically, it doesn't make them sick, but when these ticks feed on them, that's the point at which they get infected, and once they get infected, they essentially stay infected for life. However, this, bug's not, this tick and bug is not stupid, because what happens if, for instance, this tick feeds, and it feeds on a rodent that's not infected? Well, it doesn't get infected. However, that then drops off into the environment, molts to a nymph, and that also feeds on these guys. So if the tick didn't get infected as a larva, there's a chance it could get infected as a nymph, all right? That then drops off into the environment, molts to an immature adult, and then that attaches onto you, your dog, or deer. So first question, do you need deer for that life cycle to become endemic? So the answer is actually no. And you only need to go to New York, and there's a park in the center of New York where this life cycle is established. There are no deer, but the adults have learned to feed on rats. There's a question at the moment. They found the, I was talking to Robin Lindsay, the public health agency, this morning. Algonquin Island, just off Toronto. There's no deer there. They've recently found ticks. Could it establish? There aren't deer, and we're not sure what other species are there. So you don't need deer, but it's the best environment if you do have deer. So the hosts, you find the larvae, as I said, on wild rodents. And what's the species up there that I haven't mentioned so far? Birds. And I remember that because it turns out birds are extremely important with respect to what we're starting to see happening. The nymphs, again, preferred to feed on wild rodents but you will also find them on birds and particularly people. And adults, they prefer deer, but you find them on your pets and you find them on yourself. Where do you typically, therefore, find this particular tick? It's typically bush and brush uh, adjacent to the deciduous forests in general. When do you find them? Adult ticks are imminently due to appear in Ontario. Dr. Barker told me it was September the 21st. <laughs> he worked for quite a few years down a long point, Lake Erie, 
did a lot of initial work there, and he said it's September the 21st. Uh, that's when you first see adults. And I used to go, that's rubbish. That can't be true. And then three years ago, I'll never forget, it was September, 21st of September, noon, I get the first phone call from a vet. <laughs> so it's typically by the third or fourth week in this month that the adults appear in the environment. We then see them typically till early November or so, and then everything goes quiet because usually there's snow cover. They then reside dormant under the snow, and then we typically see the second peak, April, May time. All right, so there's two peaks. It's important to appreciate that in between May and September, we typically, typically, or well, things are changing away from typically in some parts of Ontario, typically we don't see adults during that period, but that's when typically nymphs are in the environment. So just remember that particular issue. So what influences the risk of exposure to ticks? Like where, where how quickly will they move? So I want to show you a video. Bushes and shrubbery at the side of the road, at the edge of forests, and also in long grass in parks and gardens, they are hiding. Ticks. Ticks are widely distributed dangerous parasites that feed on the blood of their hosts and transmit diseases. In order to reach their host, they climb up blades of grass and wait for potential hosts to come along. The first pair of legs which possesses a sensory organ, is positioned up in the air. In this way, they seek a suitable host. Ticks are wiped off the grass by passing hosts. Within seconds, the tick clings to the hair coat of the animal. Once in position on the skin of the animal, the tick looks for a suitable place to take its blood meal. With sharp, scissor-like points at the end of its mouth parts, the tick pierces the skin then thrusts the suction tube with its barbed hooks into the hole. In some tick species, a cement-like substance strengthens the attachment. Thus, the tick is firmly attached during its blood meal. Along with the saliva it secretes, an infected tick can transmit various diseases caused by microorganisms such as anaplasma, babesia, ardecia, and borrelia. At the end of the blood meal, which can take several days, during which its weight multiplies several times, the tick drops to the ground. Often, the dog may not have even noticed it was there. So the important thing to take from note from that is, unlike, for instance, that fleas that literally will hunt you within reason, ticks just sit on blades of grass and wait for you or your pet to pass by. So they don't move by themselves any significant distance in the environment. So what's our current understanding of the distribution of this particular tick? This is a map from 2010 in green of the distribution of Ixodes scapularis, the tick of interest to us. So that was what was published in 2010. So the obvious question to ask then is, so how does the risk of Lyme disease, firstly in people, relate to that distribution. I want to show you the CDC map for the US. So cases of human Lyme disease in the US for 2013. That's the map, that's the distribution of human cases. It's not the entire distribution of this tick, all right? It's only the northern distribution. 80, 90% of all the human cases of Lyme disease occur on the northeastern seaboard of the US. Shouldn't surprise you, that's where it originated, Lyme in Connecticut. So it's states like New Hampshire, New Jersey, um, Connecticut, Rhode Island, all right? Um, another 10, 15% of all the other human cases uh, are Minnesota and Wisconsin. What do we see in dogs? I'm gonna show you seroprevalence for dogs. For the US, it's no different, all right? The darker the blue, the greater the proportion of seropositive dogs in a municipality. That dark blue is more than 5% of dogs seropositive. So it's exactly the same as the distribution of hum human disease. Dogs are in fact surrogates for exposure for people. Wherever you see exposure in dogs, you have to assume people are getting exposed. Well then, why this distribution of the ticks? Why is it so different? And the reason is, 
we believe it's because this southern dish population of ticks, the immature stages primarily do not feed on wild rodents. They feed on things like lizards that aren't infected. All right, so that's the reason for that. So what about Canada? Prior to 1995, the only place in Canada where this tick occurred, and certainly back to the early 1970s, Dr. Lindsay tells me he thinks it may be even earlier than that, the only place in all of Canada was Long Point, Lake Erie. That was it until the mid-1990s. Then for at least the last 15, 20 years, the Public Agency of Canada has been operating a passive surveillance system. So whenever you or your friend picks one of these ticks off, yourself or a pet, it's sent to the central uh, lab for the Public Health Agency in Winnipeg, and they then screen these ticks for Borrelia burgdorferi. So this is all the ticks they received in 2008. Where are most of them coming from? It's the Maritimes, so it's New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, southern Quebec, right throughout southern Ontario, and southern Manitoba. So, whenever you find, and just sorry, on that map, note, there were a few odd ticks like northern Alberta. Whenever they receive ticks like that, they always ask the question, is this an adventitious tick, which means a tick that's recently fallen into the environment? How do you think that might happen every spring? Birds. Every spring, there's a significant migration of birds from the northeastern seaboard of the US into Canada. The folks in the Public Health Agency have estimated that every spring, they bring somewhere between 50 and 175 million of these ticks into Canada. So, they will drop off into the environment. Most never survive, all right? The bigger concern for the public health agency are what are called endemic populations. So that's a population not only has arrived, but now is actively breeding. All the conditions are right for its establishment. So I'm going to come back to that issue in a minute. Is the risk of Lyme disease increasing in Ontario? I want to show you what's been happening in the US. And remember, birds every spring migrate starting from this area. I, showed, I didn't show you this map before. This is 2001. I'm going to show you the 2013 map. I would never have believed you would see a significant difference within a 12-year period. Let me show you. So this is human cases of Lyme disease reported in the US, 2001. And this is 2013. 2001, 2013. So just look at this distribution first. 2001, 2013. What's happening to the distribution? I think you can see it's moving northwest. Now, one of the obvious questions is, is this biased by increased surveillance? Partly, but almost certainly not entirely. All right? So, the same thing's happening here. That's 2001, 2013. It's dispersing, and one of the areas it's dispersing into is in southern Manitoba. All right? So, where did I say was the only occurrence of the tick prior to the mid-1990s? Long Point, Lake Erie, all right? In the last 15 years, folks working with Claire and others have established endemic areas in Ontario. And this was the map for a few years ago. It's essentially the national parks along the northern shore of Lake Erie and Lake Ontario, but also the Thousand Islands area. Why do you think it's those national parks? Because if you're a bird migrating north every spring, the first Tim Hortons stop-off point <laughs> for your migration point, if you want a breather, you land in those parks, and that's why those ticks have established there and become endemic populations. So, it's one thing for ticks to establish, but then the obvious question is, well, okay, the ticks are there, but are they infected with the pathogen that causes Lyme disease? Robin Layton's Lindsay in the Public Health Agency kindly shared me these passive surveillance data for Ontario from 2007 through to 2013. And this is the number of ticks they received in Ontario of cats, dogs, people, and other species. You can see on average, just over two thousand, sorry, two thirds of the ticks are off people, and about a quarter of the ticks are off dogs. What did they find? Well, this is the same data for each of these years. The first column is the number, and what's more relevant is the percentage of the ticks testing positive for Borrelia burgdorferi. Because one of the obvious questions is, it's the right tick, what's the chance it's infected? Because it's not all of them. 
Back in 2007, 7.5% were testing positive on the basis of PCR. And look what's been happening to the figure ever since. It's been progressively increasing to a figure of 2013 of 18.4 percent. So in 2013, on average, approximately one in five ticks were infected. Is it likely it's going to go further? Yes, and I'll show you how much further in a second. The other pathogen that public health is particularly concerned about is anaplasma. Just to show you the same data, it's very low. It always typically is a lot less than the Borrelia burgdorferi data, and it hasn't yet been creeping up. The last column is the number of geographic locations. This is based just on town name, and the locations, as far as their database is concerned, shouldn't surprise you. It's been progressively increasing. So, what are the take-home messages for the percentage of ticks positive for Borrelia burgdorferi? Well, I've just shown you the passive surveillance data for Ontario for 2013. 18.4% positive for Borrelia burgdorferi. If you travel anywhere in Canada, what's the answer? On average, 18%. It's a little different. However, if you travel to some of the original places where this tick first established, the prevalence is significantly higher. If you're someone that likes going to Point Pelee, it's up at 27%. And what I refer to as the holy grail for Lyme disease in Canada, which is Long Point, Lake Erie, and this is for 2009, the figure was 60%. All the evidence is it's going to progress, so the longer the ticks are in an area, the eventually things are going to progress to at least that prevalence level. Now, one of the issues, I know Claire has struggled with this, working with a public health agency, they traditionally, people like to put risk maps together on the basis of endemic populations. I want to show you how much work Claire and her colleagues put into doing this, because it, be it begs the question, is it practical on a long-term basis? A few years ago, 10 years ago, I think if you went to the Thousand Islands area, there were no ticks. There literally were no ticks. And then suddenly Claire and myself started getting people phoning up saying, I think there's Ixides scapularis in the Thousand Islands area. So Claire, along with colleagues, did some of these studies. This is called tick dragging. If anyone wants something neat to do next summer, this could be your project. All right? They literally, she sends these students out um, through the bush, areas where the habitat looks suitable, and they've focused on 12 suitable sites across the Thousand Islands area, and they literally drag for multiple hours and regularly look on this cloth for the presence of ticks. So, they did this primarily in 2009 and 2010. You can see 33,000 ticks were examined, all right? The important thing to note is adults and nymphs were present and a large number of larval stages. So they found not only all three life cycle stages, but large numbers as well in multiple locations, all right? They also trapped rodents. Was there evidence the rodents were infected? So these are ticks feeding here. And they submitted the ticks for identification of Borrelia burgdorferi and found it was a significant issue. If you look at an index of tick burden over these 12 locations, particularly from 2009 and 2010, the y-axis is, is referred to as the number of adult ticks per two-person hours of dragging. It's just an index for abundance. And you can see that's the figure overall for the 12 sites in 2009. Remember, there weren't supposed to be any ticks there, all right? It had gone up, it effectively doubled a year later and almost went up the same amount the following year. So, large numbers of ticks, that's just the adults. Remember, there were many more immature stages. If you look at the average proportion of ticks infected on the 12 sites, it varied from 0 to 63%, and that was the average, just under 31%. So, a very recently established area. In some areas, already a significant proportion of ticks were infected. That's what Claire does extremely well. And that's defining an area as endemic. And the purists, and I better be careful here, Claire, but the purists for many years said, if you want to convey public health information to the public, you can only do it with endemic risk maps. 
because that proves the ticks there, the bugs there, it's circulating in the wildlife. But what's the problem with that approach? Oh, sorry, and I don't mean this in a negative way, Claire. I think there's two issues. It's a lot of work, and it's a significant amount of money. And because this is changing so quickly, if you base maps on endemic risk, proven like this, you're going to be at least a few years behind what is actually happening in the field. So you can't keep up with a rapidly emerging vector-borne disease such as this. So I think, and what's very interesting, in the last few years, public health in Ontario has shifted away from wanting endemic risk areas to what they refer to as Lyme disease risk areas. And this is the map, the first one I've seen, came out in May of this year. What does this show? What this shows is every one of these round circles in the center was an area they went out to and they dragged. They dragged and in two seasons detected the tick. And that's it. There's no testing of ticks. There's no screening of the wildlife. The general assumption is there's lots of evidence within three to five years of ticks establishing. And by dragging in two seasons, you effectively have ruled out the chance this could be a few that have fallen off a bird, all right? We know from other studies that within three to five years of establishment, you have the bug in the ticks. So each one of these at the center is where dragging over two seasons found the tick, and then they've put a 20-kilometer zone around that. And the way the public health community manages Lyme disease now in people is driven very much by this particular map. And I'll explain in a minute. Let me just point out, long point, that was the original area, all right? Since my endemic map I showed you was put together, it actually has been shown within the last year or two, there's been an establishment here. It shouldn't be surprising, it's another area where birds land. And look at this area here. This is what was all in the news earlier this area, the GTA area, all right, Morningside Park, Rouge Valley, and the question mark um, about Algonquin Island. So, there's clear evidence that the prevalence, the sort of distribution of ticks, the abundance of ticks is changing dramatically. What evidence is there that exposed, so that dogs are becoming more and more commonly exposed, that people are becoming more commonly exposed? Is there any evidence? Well, I mentioned most of you, if you have your dog screened with heart for heartworm every year, this is the typical kit that's used. Simultaneously, you screen dogs for antibody, just antibody to Borrelia burgdorferi. So, how many dogs have been screened? We don't do this with people, but we do it with our pets. So we have a lot of data. The data that's publicly available is for 68,500 dogs in 2007. This is for Ontario. Slightly smaller number in 2008, and very recently, I've been able to get through colleagues uh, in Oklahoma State University, the IDEX data as well, for 2013-2014. So, 2007, the proportion of the dogs testing positive that had antibody was 0.58%. Now, when, that data, when those data came out, IDEX sent them to every veterinary practice across Canada with the following quote. Let me read this to you. This data demonstrates that, as quote, a significant percentage of dogs in Ontario have been exposed to Borrelia burgdorferi, the agent that causes Lyme disease. Let me give you significant. <laughs> If you go to places like Connecticut, 40, 50, 60%, sometimes higher than that, so more than half of all the dogs are seropositive, all right? Most dogs also never become clinical. That's the proportion positive for anaplasma. Shouldn't surprise you, we didn't have the tick prior to the mid-1990s, so all Ontario dogs should be seronegative if they've stayed in the province, which is great if you're a dog, you have a negative status um, to begin with. 2008 hadn't changed much. And then I managed to get the data for the last two years. So for all of Ontario, I haven't done the stats, um, but the denominator for these populations is very large. 2.31% of all the dogs tested in Ontario positive now. We've seen similar slow increases elsewhere in Canada. If you split the data up to what's considered the high risk area of Ontario, and that is Eastern Ontario, it's up to 5.1%. And then if you look at all the other dogs, 
it's 0.9%, all right? So that's excluding the high risk area, all right? Let me show you those data graphically. I only got this two days ago from colleagues at Oklahoma State. And what they've done, they've plotted the same data that we already had the map for the US. So this is seroprevalence of dog populations by municipality. The darker the blue, the greater the proportion of dogs testing seropositive. If there are less than 10 samples from municipality, it's not reported, all right? The, look at just the dark color, 5% or more. Shouldn't surprise you, that's, we already knew that was the case in the northeastern seaboard of the US. Where are what are recognized as the hot spots for dogs with respect to seroprevalence? There's a small hot spot in the central part of Nova Scotia, central part of New Brunswick, across much of southern Quebec, eastern Ontario, and then there's this pocket in southeastern Manitoba. Remember, if there's a significantly elevated seroprevalence in dogs, What's the exposure likely be to be for people? You're in the same areas as your dogs. So that's evidence, I think it's early, but suggestive evidence that exposure is changing significantly in dogs. What about people? We don't do serology on people, but we do do disease in people. And since at least 2002, Lyme disease has been a reportable disease in people. It's ironic, it's reportable in people. It's nothing like that in our pets, and yet we're in the same environment, all right? So I need to tell you a few things about the disease in people because it is different from dogs. A few important facts, all right? First important fact is unlike dogs, on average, somewhere between about 60 and 80% of people that have had an infected tick feed on them develop a skin lesion called erythema migrans. It's a, by definition, and the definition is here, all right, it's a lesion more than five centimeters in diameter that typically develops one to two weeks after a tick is fed. Now, many of you I know have been probably bitten by a tick or any bug, and at the time you remove it, within a few hours to a day or so, you'll see a small red lesion associated with the bite, a hypersensitivity reaction. They never progress to this size, particularly a week or so later, all right? So, it's called erythema migrans, and it's a very common early indication of infection, what's called cutaneous Lyme disease, all right? It is true after that if the infection isn't treated, and at that point it responds very well to antibiotic treatment, but after that it progresses to what's called extracutaneous Lyme disease, typically involves joints, as we see in dogs, the nervous system, or the heart, all right? However, it responds early on very effectively to treatment. So I made that point there. So, let me tell you what the case definition is for confirmed cases of Lyme disease in Ontario at the moment. I need to read these to you. Two of them are based on this risk map. That is, clinician confirmed skin lesion greater than five centimeters with a history of residence in or visit to a Lyme disease endemic area or risk area. These have been sent to physicians across the province because like vets, I think most physicians weren't aware of what was happening. So if you've got a skin lesion confirmed by a clinician and you've traveled into one of these areas, you will be treated. You're a confirmed case and reported. If you have clinical evidence, so this is clinical signs that develop after it's progressed out of the skin, and those clinical signs are very nonspecific. So for instance, you've got lameness. Or what do we call that in people? Limping, sorry, yes, sorry. <laughs> sorry, all right. So if you have clinical signs that are consistent with the disease once it's progressed, but you also have laboratory confirmed infection by either PCR or culture, so that's direct evidence of infection, you are, and so at that point, you're considered a case and you're treated. The last definition, is clinical evidence of Lyme disease, so the name, same non-specific signs with laboratory support by serology. So you're seropositive. There's no direct culture or identifying of the organism, and you have a history of residence in or visit a risk area. That's a confirmed case, all right? They have a definition of probable cases 
which is this one and this one without the history of travel because they recognize things are changing year by year and a probable case often will be treated at the discretion of the physician. So let me show you what's been happening to the number of diagnoses, all right, of Lyme disease in people from 2002 to 2014. This is publicly available but was given to me kindly by Curtis Russell. This indicates in dark green the number on the y-axis of confirmed cases in the province and in light green the number of probable cases. All right, that's the number on the left and because the Ontario population has been increasing over the last few years, the right associated with this black line shows the same data converted to the number of cases per 100,000 head of the population. As you will see, well, there's a number of take-home messages. Firstly, there were no probable cases prior to 2009, and that is because that definition didn't exist. What they have assured me is that the change in the definition of confirmed and probable cases from 2009 onwards, if you add them both together, they're what the probable cases were in total before. All right, so the total number on the basis of definition is effectively the same throughout. You can see it's been progressively increasing. This dip in 2014 was observed elsewhere in the US as well. Appears to be significant changes in climate that year. We wait to see what happens this year. So, just like dogs, disease in people has been increasing significantly. What about seasonality? This is when the human cases were diagnosed in 2014. Again, dark green confirmed cases, light green, green, green probable cases. The peaks in July, but the interesting thing is to note the tail goes right out to November. Most human cases are diagnosed within a month of the tick feeding. All right, so these cases are probably associated with the adults that appear at that time. It's thought most of these cases are associated with nymphs in the environment. All right. Why is the distribution changing? There's a number of things that are thought to be driving this. It's thought bird migration plays a significant role and that it was progressively building up on the northeastern seaboard. Birds were always migrating, but it must have hit a critical mass where suddenly now enough ticks were coming in, there were enough to establish. But there are other reasons. The deer populations have been changing in certain places because we think reforestation is a good idea. Lastly, it appears that climate change is also a driver. And this is a modeling map derived by Nick Ogden at the Public Health Agency of Canada. And what they've done is they've used climate change models for the year 2000 through to 2080 to look at what is the predicted ideal suitable climate for this tick. So the thing to look at is just the red here. That's considered high climatic suitability. That's just climate. It doesn't tell you the environment is all suitable, it tells you the climate is predicted to be suitable. So temperature, humidity, all right? Back in 2000, 2000, very little of Ontario was considered suitable. If you then go forward in time, 2020, look at the red, 2050, so this is looking at multiple climate change predictions, 2080. The interesting thing is, so that's 2020, the interesting thing is, and certainly in some parts of the province, certainly eastern Ontario, what we're seeing is exactly consistent with what they were predicting on the basis of climate suitability. Please note, by the year 2080, this does not mean the tick will be over all this distribution, because the environment may not be suitable throughout this area, all right? But it, does, it is consistent with climate being a driver. The last thing I just wanted to finish off with was just to look at a few very practical questions for vets. Firstly, should dogs be routinely screened for antibody to, to the bug that causes Lyme disease? We use this kit and it detects an antibody to an outer surface antigen of the bug. Some of you may use the Lyme vaccine on your dog. It's not supposed to be used in people, all right? It does not interfere with this test. IDEX has been strongly saying that if you get a positive with this test, you should therefore get a titer. This is just yes, no. Is there antibody there or not? You can also get an antibody titer. This is a highly controversial area because they have been saying if the, the antibody level is above this threshold, consider treatment. 
which implies, which means you're going to treat your dog daily with doxycycline for 28 days. So there's a lot of people doing it. It is useful for, for monitoring response to treatment, but there is no peer-reviewed data shows there's any relationship between antibody titer and risk of disease in dogs. So if your healthy dog, because typically your dog is healthy when it goes for its annual test, if your healthy dog tests positive for Borrelia, how should it be managed? Well, the consensus statement says, as I already said, most seropositive dogs will never become ill with Lyme disease and don't need to be treated. So what's the obvious next question? So why are you testing for it in the first place? This is the algorithm they provide. There's no question. If your dog is sick in any way, treat it. If it's not sick, no treatment is preferred as long as you check the urine is normal. There is a small proportion of dogs, and this occurs less commonly in people than in dogs, develop renal involvement that can be fatal. So clinical signs in dogs, these develop two to five months later, so a long time after tick exposure. It's classically a shifting intermittent lameness, which is like people. Dogs don't get the other systemic manifestations. So this is a dog lame for a few days on its right forelimb, another dog right hind limb, and then it shifted a few days later to another limb. The first limb in dogs that usually develops lesions is the limb the tick was feeding on. So just before you walk away from your healthy dog that's testing positive, check that the urine is normal. And there are recommended treatment protocols that are essentially identical as what we use in people. So I'm going to give you two pictures of ticks and ask you, will my dog get Lyme disease? Are you ready for this? Before, you, but before I give you those, I need to give you important facts to remember. Number one, and I haven't told you this, the tick cannot transmit the bug to you or your pet until it's fully fed. All right? So it needs to look like this. Not that big, all right? <laughs> But it's, and it's unusual. Many tick-borne pathogens transmit quickly. The bug that causes Lyme disease is unusual. The tick needs to be attached for at least 36 hours. All right, so one fact. Next fact, in Ontario, just under 20% of all the ticks are infected. As far as dogs are concerned, if the dog gets exposed, they develop antibody three to five weeks later. And I just told you, if they're going to develop disease, it happens two to five months later. It's incredibly slow. But the thing that's very different from people, 95% of infected dogs never become clinical. So first question, are you ready for this? This comes into you, and it could be off a person, it could be off a dog. I'm supposed to talk about dogs, because I think it's illegal for me to talk about people. But <laughs> it's never stopped me, all right? Will my dog get Lyme disease? What do you think? Is it the right tick? Yes. yes, it is. What's the problem? So why is the answer no? It's not fed. All right, this tick is not fed. It's unusual we remove these from dogs. We're good at removing these from ourselves. We're much better at doing it. Next one. Will my dog get Lyme disease? Well, is the answer no? So is it the right tick? Has it fed? Is it well fed? Oh, it's so well fed. I've never seen such a happy tick. So the chance it's infected on average, just under 20%. And only 5% of those are ever gonna go clinical. So there's about a 1% chance your dog's gonna go clinical. All right, now it's different with people. Most exposed people do go on to develop infection, disease rather. What's happened in the veterinary area, which is not happening in the human area, and I don't know why vets have ignored this, this is not done by the public health community. If this tick comes off you, we do it because we can. And that is, why not send the tick off, right, for PCR testing? It costs 50 bucks, the vet will charge you 100 bucks, and they can tell you whether or not the tick's infected. Remember, the public health community does not use this sort of information for defining Lyme disease and the justification for treatment. We do, and I don't understand why. So you can send ticks off for PCR testing. People like Patrick who are in the room um, develop PCR methods, 
but you need to be very, very, very careful about what you pay for, all right? Because many diagnostic labs initially let you screen for all of these tick-borne pathogens. This is called genus-level testing. So for Borrelia, which we're interested in, they were doing a PCR. Borrelia SPP means our PCR detects any Borrelia species. The reality is there's about 50 of them, all except one essentially, all except one essentially are not pathogenic, and they occur in all ticks. So there's no point doing it, or if you're going to do it, unless you pay for what's called species-specific testing for Borrelia burgdorferi. Let me show you someone who went really wrong. They phoned me up and said, I've got a dog that's going to get Lyme disease. What do I treat with? And I said, well, what tick did you submit to IDEX? And they said, oh, I have a picture. And I said, well, can you send me the picture and can you send me the report? I know it's going to get Lyme disease. Just tell me what to treat. So they sent me this picture, and that was the report from the lab. So it's test positive for Borrelia SPP, which to the vet thought, well, that's Lyme disease. That just means any of Borrelia species. So the bigger question is, what's wrong with the slide? It's the wrong tick. All right, why would you submit the wrong tick? All right, for a test that's useless. <laughs> so the options for our pets, if you find a fully engorged tick, if you follow what the humans are doing and the ACVIM consensus statement, the only thing you would do is manage the dog for clinical signs for the next six months and the evidence of renal involvement. And if there's no abnormalities, that's it. That's what our human counterparts would do in this situation. If you've got paranoid owners, which I realize is an issue occasionally, you could do serology on the dog today, because it's usually negative in Ontario, and go back two months later. A negative result is a lot more helpful than a positive. Because remember, if it goes positive, there's only a 5% chance it's going to go clinical. That takes two months, and I realize some people are very concerned about this issue, or you could pay for a tick PCR. You will get the result within a week, it's the same issue. A negative result is a lot more helpful than a positive. As far as prevention is concerned, what should you be doing with your pets? There are preventative products that you can put on your pets, and there are vaccines. We essentially don't have those for people. So if you have concerns and you're hiking in areas where this tick goes, just recognize, all right, use repellents on your, you can spray your legs or long pants, all right, to try and prevent the tick from attaching. And the most important thing to do is to start doing daily tick, whoops, daily tick checks. If you check yourself and your pet every 24 hours, you will find the tick before often it's attached or certainly before it's fully engorged. All right. So I hope that's been a useful introduction um, to what's happening with this tick uh, and what's happening with Lyme disease. I think all the evidence is it's only going to get worse and we have to start learning to live with it, as they do on the northeastern seaboard. Just in passing, I just would like to thank all these people. Claire kindly has, in the past, allowed me to share some of her data, along with Robin Lindsay from the Public Health Agency of Canada, Curtis Russell from Public Health in Ontario, and IDEX and colleagues at Oklahoma State who got hold of Canada's IDEX data. Please don't tell me how people in Oklahoma got Canada's data, but it happens. Anyway, thanks very much. Any questions? Yes. How long will an unfed adult tick survive? How long do they survive? I mean, how, Claire, you might be able to answer this better than How can a, an unfed adult tick survive? I think it depends on the climate, effectively. All right, it could be weeks, it could be days. All right, but it very much depends on the environment. Was the question back? Yes, there. In Guelph, I don't know. So, and so what do you mean by incidence? You mean the incidence of exposure or the incidence of disease? So I don't know the figure um, for the Guelph area specifically. I could go into the data and look for it. They're, so they're trying to make all this publicly available and available in real time, encouraging vets to report as they diagnose this, the, these infections. Alex. Um, so thanks a lot. That was really interesting, and I learned a lot. I just had one question I wanted to pick your brain about. In diagnostics, we sometimes see 
Exodes QPI as well, in addition to Scapularis. And I was wondering if um, people are only identifying genus level instead of species level, if that skews the data. Right. So Alex brings up this point. There are some other Ixodes species out there in Ontario. So perhaps the most common one is Ixodes cookai. So, so have I simplified things too much? The answer is yes, Alex. But and I recognize the certain proportion of the Ixodes that I showed you to identify. They likely won't be Ixodes scapularis. However, the issue is I think in the past my profession has been notoriously bad at complicating the issue to the extent that everyone just says oh, it's too complicated. All right, at least so I recognize you're going to overdiagnose. All right, um, and the public health folks do go that far. Right, but I think if you're doing this in practice, if you're doing this itself, at least say whether it's dermocenter or an Ixodes. Um, it'll cut down a significant proportion of concern. Any other questions? Oh, sorry, do you get one? Yes, okay. I remember reading an article, is that actually a newspaper, a scientific article, uh, talking about the organisms that were in the environment and in the rat, or sorry, the mouse, wait for the mouse population, there was an association with the health of the gypsy moth population in that area. Claire, I'm going to have to look to you. Do you know the answer to that? Yeah, I'm not. I'm not sure about that, but I think just the the population fluctuations in the rodents themselves might have an impact. I mean, I think they associate it with you know good years of acorns for the, the mice populations increase, and then we see it. You know, increased density of mice and potentially an increase um, in the in the agent as well. So it's a very indirect association. Yeah, I, th I think anyway. That's All right, thanks. Any other questions? So the tick gets attached to you. You imagine it has to sit for about thirty six hours to feed and get fully engorged. As a human being, this may sound silly, but things like taking showers do that help so do t so ironically there's clear evidence that taking showers greatly helps <laughs> but I'll, let me just explain so the first one of the first questions does anyone so am i allowed to ask personal questions i think i can Casey. What's, what's the worst they can do fire me yeah go for it i was going to ask the question i lived in africa for 12 years so the answer to this question is yes for me does anyone does anyone know they've been fed on by a tick interesting okay and most, most people don't know that's happening because when they feed, they effectively use an anesthetic. So you don't feed, feel the attachment, you don't feel um, them feeding. However, every single time it's happened to me, I found the tick fully engorged when I'm having a shower. So showering has nothing to do with washing the tick off, but when we shower, we're extremely good at knowing what's us and what's not. <laughs> we, we know where I'm, sorry, the, so the acting dean's here, rolling his head. But I mean, seriously, we know where all our moles are, where all our lumps and bumps are. And the place in humans where you most commonly get them, so it's hot, humid areas. So it's the groin, the armpits, and sometimes around the back of the head, all right? When we shower, we know when we have moles there and when we don't. And every tick I ever found, I went, whoops, that's funny, I don't have a tick there, and then I would look and go, oh, it's a tick. <laughs> Sorry, I don't have a mole there, I have a tick. I don't know if anyone, so one of the recommendations is shower daily. <laughs> there are multiple benefits from showering. <laughs> does, it, does anyone else want to comment on how they found the tick? If you can keep it politically correct. So shower daily and check yourself and your pets daily. All right? Sorry? Washing, do <laughs> well, <laughs> That wouldn't work. It works checking visually your dog. So we're watching the TV every night, just check your dogs for ticks. I, I've given many talks to field naturalist clubs on this issue, and regularly by the end of the talk, I get a question, does, does, this, does this mean I have to give up going hiking? Like it sounds like it's horrendous. And, and my comment to them is no, go on holiday to Connecticut during tick season and talk to the locals about how they've learned to do it. Because we're not used to daily tick checks, they are. They're used to the other tick control practices that you can use on your pets. Um, we're not typically as used to it over there. And they live quite happily with ticks. And I think we've got to develop that mentality as well. I should stop because I ran over a bit. Thank you very much for your time.
if you have any questions, please feel free to get in touch. Okay,